And I am going to hand the baton to Suzanne, who uh, is leading the discussion today. And I will just be in the background as another participant, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Suzanne? Yes, uh, thank you, Nate. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, so excited to be here, so excited to be with you all. Um, so uh, my name is Suzanne Köseoğlu, and I'm a lecturer at Greenwich University um, in the UK. So today we will be talking about feminist pedagogy, feminist digital pedagogy, feminism, and perhaps many other things. Um, this is partly structured, partly unstructured. We'll be reading um, sections from our work. This could be something from uh, the collaborative book project, Feminist Digital Pedagogy, Feminist Critical Digital Pedagogy. I'm gonna be reading something from my blog. So you, please, uh, you are welcome to contribute to this uh, topic. I mean, you, you are, we are hoping to hear from you on, um, you know, many different threads, but especially feminism and feminist pedagogy. So please feel free to use the chat and also um, use Twitter. You can use um, hashtag MyFest22 or hashtag Feminist Digital Pedagogy. Um, so um, I have a few slides, um, but I won't be doing a lot of talking. I just wanted to talk about a, a recent book project. So let me share my slides with you. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So I am sharing my um, Google pages with you. Please let me know if you can see the page because <laughs> I don't know what you're seeing. It looked great. Yeah, okay. So yes, yeah, so the uh, title of our session is Feminist Critical Digital Pedagogy, a bricolage. Um, and here is the hashtag we thought we could use, but you know, you, you might use other hashtags and that's absolutely fine. So it's bricolage, it's, um, it's a construction of creation of work from a diverse um, range of things. So here, you know, with this conversation, we're not trying to define feminist digital pedagogy. We're trying to um, provide a picture and we will be talking about that later in the discussion. So it's, it's gonna be a diverse picture. And if you contribute to the discussion, it will be even more diverse and more valuable, more interesting for all of us. So George Velicianos and I, we did um, an open book project, Feminist Critical Digital Pedagogy. This is published on EdTech Books. It's something I'm really excited about. I'm really proud of the work we've done so far. It's a collaborative project. Um, all the authors and the editors, we all worked together for this and we worked hard. And um, now we have a really you know, good start. This is an open book. We're still accepting contributions to the book. And we have three more chapters coming in in summer. So we're very excited to share these new chapters with you. So if you have time, please have a look at the link. Um, I'll paste a, a link in the chat box later on. Um, so with that being said, I don't wanna to do too much talking. I'll hand it over to Brenna. Um, she has the first chapter in the book. And um, yes, Brenna. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not really, I don't really want to introduce people. Uh, please introduce yourself to the audience and, you know, however you'd like to go about this uh, part of the session. Thank sure. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm so glad to have so many people joining us here today. This project has been oh, just one of my favorite writing experiences. We had a really collaborative um, editorial process for the, for the book chapters as well that I found really enriching. And so I, if you're at all interested in getting involved with this book project, uh, I strongly recommend it. It's been really positive. Um, my name is Brenna Clark Gray. I'm coordinator of educational technologies at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, British Columbia. If you've never heard of Kamloops, BC, we're in the BC interior. So we're just sort of about four hours um, north east of Vancouver and uh, kind of halfway between Vancouver and Calgary in the desert, uh, which is it's a beautiful day today. Like we haven't had the sun in, in many days. So it's really exquisitely beautiful. And I keep looking outside. Um, these are the traditional and unceded lands of the of Tukumlup's Taste uh, and the nation in which uh, I reside is Sequapum Ulu. And I'm a very grateful but uninvited visitor to these lands. Um, so my book chapter here is called The University Cannot Love You, Gendered Labor, Burnout, and the COVID-19 Pivot to Digital. Um, and I wanted to write about the experience of pivoting our campus online uh, and the sort of affective experience in particular of that. 
Um, I'm really indebted to Allison Mounts. Uh, she has an article that I'll share a link to in the chat. It's footnoted in, um, in the chapter. She has a, a piece called Women on the Edge, which is all about sort of a gendered labor within the institution and, and the impact of um, stress on the body. Uh, and it's a really fantastic piece and it was very eye-opening for me. And so this piece comes from maybe that, that ethic. Uh, so I'm going to read just the first two chapters from the section called Resisting Neoliberal Manifestations of Care. The title of that section gives you a vibe for how this chapter goes, I suppose. Anyway. Uh, in a recent meeting of our book club at my institution, we found ourselves joking about what it was we really needed to be able to do our jobs effectively. We were a room of care workers broadly conceived, faculty support and instructional faculty, folks who are at the center of a stressful transition to fully online teaching. We weighed the likelihood of the thing we really needed, adequate staffing for faculty support and smaller classes for instructional faculty versus what we were actually getting. Yet another offer to take a yoga class or a mindfulness workshop on Teams. One of the more kind and generous among us noted quickly that of course our frustrations shouldn't be targeting the good folks in our wellness office trying to do the work of caring for us. And that's true, of course. And yet, the university supports the development of those sessions for a reason. Wellness webinars and other representations of institutional care are typically framed as being an individual responsibility. Stress is something for the individual to manage, not something structural for the institution to resolve. This is in fact a co-opting and a neutralizing of the political dimension of care. We are invited to breathe, to meditate, to resolve the situation. We are not encouraged to organize for change. Uh, this references Audre Lorde's assertion that self-care is an act of political warfare. And indeed the history, of, uh, the history of black and indigenous invocations of care are acts of resistance and continuance, but not when it's subverted in the service of academics working harder and producing more. This indeed is the work of black feminist and womanist thinkers that considers care as radical self-preservation and survival in a world that doesn't value one's presence. And I, I don't intend to appropriate that perspective when I say that non-Black scholars can embrace these resonances and reject neoliberal representations of care that strive to individualize the experience of trauma and make survival our private problems to solve. I have come to see these wellness webinars, and I don't know about you, but they are still populating my inbox. I've seen come to see these wellness webinars as positioning my exhaustion, my stress, my overwork as something I can solve on my own with deep breathing or lunchtime yoga. These sessions invite me to see my struggle as a personal failing. I am not failing. I am being failed. Um, that's where I'm gonna stop my reading, but that line, I am not failing, I am being failed, uh, became really my mantra throughout um, the COVID-19 pivot to digital and beyond. We're entering, or many of us have already entered this era of austerity politics in our universities. And I think holding on to that sense when we are in the thrust of burnout that we are not failing, we are being failed is really important. Okay, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you, Brenna. Um, so perhaps we could go around the room, including the audience, you know, participants, I can't see you, but please, um, you know, share your responses, your reactions, your feelings you know, the connections in the chat and perhaps also on Twitter. Um, you might feel more comfortable doing it here. That's absolutely fine. You know, just we would like to hear from you. We would like to see what you think about what Brenna just shared with you. So shall we go around the room very quickly when I say room, the virtual room, including participants? Um, so yes. So Tanya, shall we start with you? Just just very briefly, could be one word, a sentence, you know, just very briefly, what's your initial reaction to what Brenna just shared with you? With yeah, all of us? we're, I mean, yeah, we're being, we're being failed in so many ways. Absolutely. Um, one concept that, um, that came to me was collective wellness as radical change, um, sort of a, a resonance. Mm -hmm. Collective wellness as radical change. Is that what you said? Yes, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. what's happening. Yes. One thing I thought about is something Sarah Ahmed said. She talks about um, the symbolic commitment of institutions versus the lived reality, lived experience in her book, um, Living a Feminist Life, I think, <laughs> one of her books. So that, that Brenna, what you sh shared reminded me of this, you know, there's this 
symbolic commitment of institutions to inclusion, well-being, social justice, but there is also this lived reality and the tensions between the two. Um, are, do we have any questions from the audience? Brenna, would you like to facilitate this part if, you, if there are any questions from the audience? Sure, any responses? Brenna, I just wanted to thank you for bringing um, your own experience of motherhood into this writing. I think you acknowledge really early on in the chapter that it's like the first time it's entered into your uh, writing, you know, like in your position. And I think it's really interesting um, that aspect. I think so often it's seen as a liability, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was just so. Uh, I, I just, it, I felt very seen. So thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I am, um, it was really conscious for me because as, as anyone knows, the, the pandemic from, from so many of us involved like this absolute collapsing of any sort of imagined line between the personal and, and the professional. Um, there's a part in the chapter where I talk about trying to be seen as like this, um, you know, the, what I was structurally, which was the faculty lead in this massive moment of change and turmoil for so many people, um, and also like literally like wiping a bum on camera, because that was also part of my life. Um, and so yeah, this was the first time I really talked about motherhood in my scholarly writing. It was also, and this is where I come back to Alison Mounts, and I just realized I didn't share that link, but I will. Um, this was also the first time I acknowledged the experience of miscarriage in my scholarly writing, um, which has gone on to sort of really frame much of my thinking and writing through this period, um, as I've gone on to sustain uh, a couple more miscarriages through this period of, of stress and, and change. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things I really wanted to pull into the book chapter is the ideas like this we're supposed to be these brains in jars and the world around is not supposed to impact on the work of the academic um, and that only that has only ever worked for a very specific body right um it doesn't work for the disabled body and it doesn't work for the postpartum body or the menstruating body like there are so many bodies that can't be exclusively brains in jars and so i um yeah i really I'm, I, I wanted to tease that out a little bit and how how that impacts the experience of of working through this moment i see that maha has I'm, a question yeah i'm i'm just gonna unmute and first of all brenna you know how much i you know how much i love you and how much i love the way you share things that many of us don't say out loud and it's not it's just one of those things that's not about open access but about being open suzanne like the self as an open resource that you and mm -hmm. i worked on that I talked about in the, in the session that I did a few days ago, I was part of a few days ago. But can I also suggest that we stop sharing the screen? Because when we're having a conversation like this, it's then easier for all of us to see each other. And it feels oh, like yeah. the screen sharing isn't really mm. useful. I thought at this I point. did that already, Maha. So I. Um, the, the screen is being shared. Is it so still shared? Unshared. Okay, because I yeah. hit um, pause screen sharing. So maybe I should oh, stop I sharing. So that it doesn't move to the next slide. There yeah. we go. Yeah, there you go. Better, okay. right? Does it work now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, great. Okay, yes. I'm gonna mute again. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Trail. Um, all of well, I kind of wonder this sometimes, and I'm actually reading that Sarah Ahmed book right now, and I wonder like why we keep doing it. Like, why do we keep working this hard? <laughs> and I don't have yeah. the right answer. No. I um, it's one of the things that I try to tease apart in this chapter. Um, I felt this real sense, you know, in, in working in faculty support, there was often um, a conversation about, well, like, let's just let it break, right? Like, let Moodle break, let the video conferencing system break, like, don't work 14 hour days to try to maintain, or as I often said, don't try to hold the university together with bubble gum and sticky tape. Um, and this is where I really want to access the notion of, of both faculty support and all the kinds of work at the institution that supports students as well. Um, it's why I really like to center those as, as, as care roles, which is a way I think they're not often and explicitly thought about because I talk in this chapter about how resisting or refusing care has an immediate and harmful impact on students and, and faculty. And so there's also like the weight of that. Um, 
throughout what was already sort of a difficult and complicated period. Um, but I, I know intellectually that the answer is not to burn oneself out in service of the institution. And yet, I don't know how to operationalize that in my life, apparently. I just wanted to speak up and say the same, same butters trail. And, and thank you, Brenna. I, I also feel the same way. Like, I know I'm not, I'm not helping the situation um, because I'm not saying I'm done at X time and these projects will just not happen. And I sometimes just feel defeated mm -hmm. in the face of the structural problem. And, I, and I'm just kind of, I don't know. I don't know how to address it. It's, I'm just, I'm venting. I don't have a solution. <laughs> But thank you for raising this conversation. It is one of the great frustrations, right? The way you fix this is by staffing my team. That's how you fix yeah, this. You staff all these. Fix. You staff them. Like yes. that's what I need from you. And when that yes. is not forthcoming, it's it. It's very difficult. And I see Felicia's got this awesome point in the chat about what we model and and who we model it to. And I think that is also critical to think about, like the the ways in which every time we continue to take on overwork, we are we are modeling that behavior for others around us. Well, Sukiani, yeah, oh yeah, totally. It's just gonna be this, let's just till, I still remember saying in like April of 2020, well, it's just until the pandemic ends. <laughs> Genius over here. Laura, yeah. Well, I was gonna um, bring up the whole grading business too, because that was something that was just so shocking at my school during that, first pandemic semester, they gave us some PNP grading options really widespread, but only one semester. And I know some schools carried it on for two semesters or three, but you know, my school didn't, even though objectively in Oklahoma, fall of 2020 was worse COVID wise than the spring. And, you know, here they were talking about what can we do to help students? What we, can we do to help alleviate stress? And there it was, you know, that PNP grading option, which I think we should have all the time, not just during the pandemic, but the fact that they they took that away, despite uh, there was a student petition that got 5,000 signatures on it, which is a big deal for OU. I've never seen a student petition with that many signatures. And I don't know what it was like at other people's schools, but for me, that was the real breaking point when I realized that administratively something that they could do that, that literally wasn't gonna cost them anything, something that they had done already for one semester. So they had the IT framework in to make it possible that they wouldn't even carry that on for the second semester, push me over the, the edge. I was so disappointed and still so disappointed. I thought that was gonna be the great moment of ungrading and, and it was yeah. not. Yeah, a number of examples where I've been like, but this would cost you nothing. Yeah, I know. And, and the, there's so, there are so many altars being worshiped out there, Laura. There's the altar of, you know, rigor and reputation management. Like those are all the, the, the things that we're supposed to care about as much or more than the human beings in front of us. And uh, should we hand it over to the next reader? I don't wanna, yeah. I don't wanna take up all the time. <laughs> I was just going to suggest that. Oh, Thank perfect. you so much, Brenna. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen again. Um, this one. I'll um, stop sharing once we know who is next. Um, okay, so I have on my slides. Okay, Ju um, yes, Judith and Maura. Um, I put you together, but would you like to do separate readings perhaps? It's, it's really up to you. Um, so I'll just leave it to hand it over to Judith and Maura. Yeah, we hi, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we were gonna just do just put ourselves together for the sake of ease. But um, I'm Maura Conley. I'm a learning designer at Pratt Institute, which is on the unceded land of the Lenape people in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Judith. Yes, and I'm um, Judith Turek, and I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at the same Pratt Institute. Um, so our chapter, it, I also have to uh, say that it was such a lovely experience and um, we've come to actually um, do our own internal uh, SOTL journal based largely on the processes that we engaged in for um, this book chapter process, which was just so lovely and such a wonderful experience. So I highly recommend as well. Um, I echo those sentiments. Um, so thank you for that model, it's a lovely one. Um, our chapter, 
similarly shaded by COVID and, and the digital realm that we then found ourselves in, mostly our Center for Teaching and Learning does, um, I guess the most comparable term is professional development, though we like to see ourselves as radically different from traditional pr professional development models um, for our faculty. And so um, we have year long faculty learning communities, um, which usually gather around a specific uh, investigating a specific topic. Um, and we decided that sometimes the year long um, model can be intimidating for some of our faculty, uh, or they just might not be able to engage. We have a large adjunct population who uh, may be with us for fall and not for spring. So as such, we decided to run smaller um, deep dive communities is what we called them. And so our chapter is a reflective um, paper about uh, a feminist pedagogy deep dive that we ran in that fall of 2020, which, um, yeah, we found, Laura, I think you said this, it was much more difficult than spring when um, the original spring of pivoting to online learning. Um, and, you know, we hear from our faculty. So I think it was echoed through our students as well, but our faculty were really um, feeling burnt out. Um, so this chapter is a reflection on uh, our initial, our first offering of a deep dive in that fall of 2020. Um, and trying to embody in a digital realm, trying to embody our decentered practices um, with the theme of feminist pedagogy in the classroom with some of our faculty. Um, I think there were about 12 faculty who participated. So we're gonna um, read, uh, between you and I, we're gonna read a, a small, small excerpt, um, but that should give you a little context. Um, okay, faculty look to us for leadership in holding spaces for difficult conversations and being aware of our status as full-time employees with our own intersectional identities linked to very particular roots of power. We must continuously consider and practice the decentering of our spaces and assuring collective leadership and voice to all participants. So to the question of what are feminist pedagogical tools and practices we should keep refining in the future, we are committing ourselves to interactive community building practices. Perhaps it's not just theorizing, but more importantly, paying attention to nuances of how communities form and function, how members experience power and voice within those communities, how to build trust and connection, how to be mindful of triggers and our own embodied responses to differences are on the forefront of our collective practices at our Center for Teaching and Learning. And in this spirit of feminist values, we hope to collaborate and learn from and learn with others who are investigating these types of structures and communities. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Maura. Um, any reactions, any responses from the audience? Please unmute yourselves and just speak. It could be one word, could be a few words, or you could just, maybe you have more things to say. Um, for me, it's the idea of this work being done in community and the role of the community builder in that. Um, I, it's been a real shift in my practice. I, I think I was always aware of community, but I'm realizing, I've been thinking about how like this summer, I'm less interested in doing conferences and more interested in being like a part of events like MyFest and, and finding community um, rather than sort of presentation. Uh, so for me, that was really a resonant part of this, this sort of reflection you've been doing on your professional development work for sure. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of thinking about the nuance and the importance of the nuance, right? And and getting beyond just this, just just the, but the structure to to the all everything else that's going going on behind. And and I, I think your work really captures that idea. And and I, you know, it's it's overlooked in institutional settings over and over and over again. And I think 
part of the uh, opportunity of, of taking a feminist, critical feminist lens is that ability to, to look beyond um, and, and to rethink what's important and, and to find the words to, to say, uh, you know, the words to express what's important beyond the structures that are, you know, promised to be the things that count, right? It's all the other stuff that when, you know, we start to unpack it, I believe really, we, we realize that it's all the stuff that quote unquote doesn't count. That is really, that's where most of the important stuff seems to live. Yeah, thank you. And and I guess part of our, our reflective um, work in writing this and then since then subsequently in other sessions has been really just kind of finding, like looking at the nuances and, and sort of even evaluating our evaluative processes. Like what, like what does it mean when it works well? It doesn't mean that we have 100% participation by everybody because that's, we're not really counting the numbers. That's not what's important. What's important important is what happens in those nuanced sort of levels of connection and community and sort of going deeper instead of going wider um, and sort of looking at our practices as much as we sometimes try to and, and we, I think explained in this in this piece we try to embody we try so hard to embody these principles and they don't work sometimes and they still don't work and we're like what well, is it us is it the way we're doing it or is it the system pushing back and is it habits of mind that's preventing people from like going and maybe what we need to do is just continue doing it <laughs> like maybe that's the work the work is just keep pushing it forward and, and, and building those communities. So yeah, thank you for that. I was just gonna jump in and say thank you also for talking about adjuncts and what you said just now really resonates with that. You know, even if for all kinds of reasons, you know, systemic ones, if adjuncts can't participate in sessions like that, just because I was an adjunct all those years, um, just the fact that you're trying to make space for them and making that public statement about it, that, right there makes a difference. You know, you can't buy the adjuncts more time or reduce their course load or make their class sizes smaller, but just doing what you can to, to make that space. I know if there had been something like that at my school, I would have really appreciated that gesture. You know, we're constantly digging into that um, and not to be divisive, right? But to find our actionable next steps Really, um, we keep looking at our, um, like what we have to give part-timers um, in, in a sense of like embeddedness and community, right? First and foremost, we um, are, this deep dive community is um, a stipended process, right? So we're able to offer stipends to part-timers, which is really, we feel really strongly about that. Um, I think one of our next reflective pieces was how uh, sometimes the stipend is not enough, especially in the face of COVID, right? Um, time is really the, the thing. <laughs> um, and there is just not enough time and energy, right? So when you're asking people for that balance, it's um, you, we have to go back into that reflective process to see what works and how we can support, right? Um, it's just ever present. Adding on to that, um, I think Maura, you mentioned the embodied experience. Um, it, it, you mentioned it, I think, in the section. Um, the embodied experience, I just want to, you know, um, Laura Gibbs, Laura, I think you said, you know, why do we keep working so hard? And in this way, you know, so why can't we relax? Why do we do the things the way we do? Why do we accept things the way they are? And I think this book project made me realize that, you know, we need to slow down. And just like you said, look at the nuances, you know, and I think feminist pedagogy is a great way to do that. And all of the chapters, all of the authors are doing this so well, you know, taking just focusing on one thing. And what's unique about your chapter, when I got it, I was very excited because I've never thought about professional development, designing a professional development program from a feminist lens. I don't know why I didn't think about it, but it just didn't occur to me that, you know, this could be a thing. So your work is a, is a very helpful guide for all of us doing academic development, professional development. 
any other questions or comments from the audience, please, please use the chat box. Um, we want to have this conversation with you. Um, also, you know, feel free to use Twitter. We also have a board. Um, what's that called? Google Jam board. <laughs> Maybe we can share this at some point in the in the conversation so that you can begin adding things to it if you'd like to. So shall we uh, then move on to um, the next reading? Um, and I think that's by Tanya. Let me just share my screen. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Tanya Elias, and I am uh, four hours down the, the highway from, uh, from where Brenna is in, uh, in Kamloops in um, New Westminster or Vancouver, Lower Mainland. Um, I... I my so unlike most of you here, my my full time work is outside of higher education. So I work uh, at a, a large biotech company in the learning space, um, and I am also a student. Um, I will do my defense of my EdD at the University of Calgary on June twenty seventh. So uh, yay! I know <laughs> it's very exciting. It's taken a long time to get there, um, and so what I love about what I what I love about working outside of higher education is it gives me tremendous freedom to think about whatever I want to think about, say whatever I want to say, and two things. It doesn't matter if anybody reads it or cites it because I don't care. Um, or or no, sorry, maybe I care. I, I like when people find my work useful, but um, my my livelihood does not depend on it, right? So so I get so I choose to write. The things that I write, I, I think of myself as a as a hobbyist intellectual or a hobbyist um, hobbyist academic, uh, and and so it gives me tremendous freedom uh, to to know that that my livelihood doesn't depend on it. And I, you know, and so I also say yes and no to things that I like. And so this was a tremendous project, and um, it really it gave me the opportunity to think more deeply about something that I had written as a blog post and something that realistically it wouldn't have been published anywhere except I think this book um, and to really where I'm really trying to push push beyond those thinking about the institution and thinking what are our other models in terms of critical feminist pedagogy and, and where do we look for different ways of thinking um, and so my chapter I'm going to read a little bit of the context and then I'm going to you're going to wait listen to me scroll and then I'm just going to read a little bit at the end as well uh, so my chapter uh, involves thinking about sewing uh, and specifically sewing with uh, my uh, invalid mother-in-law um, and, um, and, and thinking about how her approach to snow sewing and how the invalid uh, approach to sewing uh, specifically boots or gummocks um, relates and doesn't relate connects and dis disconnects to the way that we think about our use of educational technology. Uh, so in the beginning, I introduce uh, the boots that I wore as a kid, which anybody who's li worked, lived anywhere in Northern Canada or Northern probably anywhere has worn big clumpy, they're usually black or gray or sometimes white in color, but you clomp around them in the snow and you take them off when you go to school and they leave puddles everywhere and you don't never move quickly and they are heavy so that was what i thought that's what i thought a boot was and i had no other um, thought of what a boot was in my life um, and then when my kids were born i was living in inuvik in the northwest territories and so for them when it came to winter footwear uh, the alternatives came in the form of gummocks handmade by their nanak their grandmother and me these gummocks were, uh, had several obvious benefits. They were hand beaded or embroidered, hand sewn and far prettier than the nondescript mass produced store-bought boots I grew up with. Every pair is different. They had other benefits. Where store-bought boots were heavy, gummocks were light. Store-bought boots fell off and could get lost in a snowbank. Gummocks were tied on. Another advantage was that gummocks could be worn directly from inside to outside. When I walked my kids to school in the morning, they shook off the snow and walked straight into this building without leaving ugly puddles behind. It was in their gummocks that were perfectly adapted to Inuvik's cold climate with dry snow that my kids learned to run fast in the snow. Gummocks offer a very different approach to the winter footwear 
that mass produced winter boot of my childhood. They offered an alternative that I could have never imagined. They were different, not only in terms of how they looked, but how they allowed my kids to move through the world. In their gummocks, I watched my kids run freely with a sense of possibilities that I could have never imagined as a kid. What then is digital pedagogy's equivalent to running fast in the snow? Just as gummocks have many benefits, many vibrant free open source software and critical digital, digital pedagogy communities exist. Thank you, so, Tanya. And oh, so gummicks were far, by far more functional choice in our northern winter months, but they weren't sold in stores. Instead, they were made by inevitable women. My mother-in-law's sewing knowledge not captured in the literature. She was told at residential school that such skills were irrelevant, and yet she learned from her mother-in-law and she chose to keep sewing. She chose to believe what she knew from her own direct experience rather than to what she was taught by the experts. What did I gain? What did my kids gain? Because my mother-in-law and her mother-in-law before her chose not to put down their sewing needles in favor of mass-produced boots. Kimmer 2013 said, this is our work to discover what we can give. Isn't this the purpose of education? To learn the nature of your own gifts and to use them for good in the world. Some of my mother-in-law's gifts include her skilled use of technologies, needles, sinew, and strong hands. Using these gifts, my mother-in-law taught me many things. She taught me to question my white womanness. She taught me that there could be other ways that challenged many things that I previously knew to be true. And although I couldn't have named it at the time, she was teaching me to think holistically and to value small. She taught me the strength of small stitches, small stories, and small ways to withstand and restore. She taught me about persistence and resistance, and I am privileged to carry these lessons uh, that challenged me to think about everything differently, including digital pedagogy. Tanya, thank you. Sorry for interrupting you earlier. Oh, no worries. I said <laughs> I had to scroll. Was a pause. Slow scroller. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, that was beautiful. Um, yes, any, any reactions and responses from the audience? I also would like to um, share a picture um, uh, of gummies, right? Is that how you say them? That's right. Um, yeah. I talked to, I read a script from Tanya's chapter in a, in a talk. And I said Cummings. <laughs> I was saying Cummings all the time. So sorry about that. I'll just share my screen to show you these beautiful Cummings. Yeah. So there you go. The ones on that. So obviously, the, there's the boots, right? The, the the boots I wore as a kid versus the uh, that's a pair of Cummings that I that I actually sewed with my uh, with my mother-in-law for for my now oldest daughter who is actually now working as a nurse in Inuvik. So. Um, uh, and looking and learn and maybe might learn how to sew herself. I think there is a second image down in the chapter. Is there? Yes. Yeah, I love this one. <laughs> and I mean, I see, Laura, you mentioned the small, that idea of small, even, you know, and, and I, I think for me, you know, we think about these institutions and these things that are big and hard, they're hard, right? They're, they're hard, they're immovable, they're all those words. and. In the chapter, I, I align those with prescriptive technologies um, versus holistic technologies and the, the things that are that are not that, that are not hard, that are soft, that do move, that are flexible. And um, and I also think about, you know, that keeping those traditions alive and doing that work, it's hard work. It was, you know, it's not easy to sew, it's not, it's not fast, it's not any of those things. And no, you know, nobody valued it, right? So, so how do we continue to do the things that matter on the edges, in the fringes, in, in all of those places when even, even though nobody cares, even though it doesn't matter uh, because we know intrinsically, you know, that it does matter. And so what, if the, if the institution doesn't value it, we'll, we'll do it because we care and because, because we know that value will come um, down the road. Um, if you don't mind, um, sorry, Christina, yeah, I just saw you raising your hands. I was just going to say that I would like to add on to this reading via a reading of mine, just very briefly, oh, yeah. two, two lines. 
So this was something because I talked about um, Tanya's work in a in a talk, as I you know mentioned before, and it's just one one very short section from there. <clears throat> um, so this is my understanding of Tanya's uh, you know the argument. Um, so I talk about like how Tanya you know um, um, you know um, learns how to sew these handmade comics with her mother-in-law, or they do it together. Um, and this is following from that description. Okay. Store-bought winter boots look alike. They're disposable, can easily be replaced. The buyer doesn't necessarily know how they are made, how the different parts of the boot are put together, the labor that produced the winter boots. Making gummicks, however, is much more than producing a technology for consumption. It's also a cultural practice. It brings people and different generations together. Um, Elias, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Elias critiques mainstream technologies in higher education. Such technologies, Elias argues, normalize neoliberalism and the culture of compliance. We use them because they're widely available, standardized, familiar, inexpensive, easy, disposable, Elias says, but they focus too much on efficiency, control, standardization, and maximizing gain. So I think Tanya has a very good critique, very um, strong critique of, um, you know, um, in a way, capitalism, <laughs> neoliberalism in higher education, because when we start using these technologies, we don't know how they're made, you know, um, we don't know the bits and parts. And I think it's a Marxist critique of technology as well, um, of labor. Um, but when you do something as a, as a community, as a cultural practice, it's, it's a much different process, isn't it? You have much more agency in the process. Um, I'm struck by this argument. I think everyone should hear about this. Um, and Tanya, you, knew, you know about this. You know, I was so passionate with this chapter. <laughs> I kept coming back to it. Shall we change the title? Shall we do this? Shall we do that? Because, you know, I think everyone really should hear about these, um, this critique of mass media um, and, you know, hear about what small technologies, small communities can bring into this discussion. So, yes, sorry. Um, so I think Christine, Christina, Christina, did you want to say anything? <laughs> I'm sorry for this uh, interruption. No, that's totally fine. I actually, the, the thing that I was just going to pick up on um, um, amongst many things was the community aspect, because that was really striking me. Um, where and it has come up in in previous conversations in this um session as well where if you know when in, in some of these technologies there doesn't doesn't feel like there's a community because it's really being done sort of outside right further beyond um you and and it you know there can be a community of users of a technology but it's really not quite the same so that idea of making it together with others was it's just really striking me and yeah just wanted to say thank you awesome and and one of the parts that you know in there i talked to about um the notion of repair right because gummicks they wear out i mean they're they're skin boots, right? They and so when they wear out, but you repair them. You don't throw them out. They so so it's not a one. I think I've been thinking a lot about how, um, you know, when when you're a community, quote unquote, community of users, that's still there's still a very big disconnect there from the people who are who develop the product to the people using it. Whereas when you're in these holistic technologies, that space between user and maker. Um, is either very, you know, it's a very small space, or it's the, exactly the same people who are using and making, and it the output, the product becomes different because the the process, the, the tech because the technological process is different, the product is um, and the output of that technological process is it, it has to be different. Like and and it goes the other way too, right? If 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 we buy into these. Uh, prescriptive approaches if if we think that's the only option then the outputs will continue to look the same because we're using the same technological process and we will and and you know we, we stay locked in the same patterns of creators and users commercialization efficiency right it, we, if we stay locked in those patterns there's there's no way out we have to get out of those patterns and challenge our thoughts about 
ease and, and complexity and what matters um, if we want to if we want to make a change. Laura. Well, I was going to just jump in and rant about the LMS a little bit in the chat. I said the, the LMS was the, the mass produced boot of ed tech. And um, I never use the LMS. I use blog networks for my classes since the dawn of time for like 20 years. And one thing that really upset me, especially with the advent of Canvas and all the user friendliness and all the, the, the everybody loves Canvas. And, and admittedly, Canvas, you know, was the lesser of evils at a certain point. I wouldn't maybe say that anymore. But, um, you know, I was being told by my administration that students want you to use Canvas. And for all the years that I taught, you know, I, I got lots of feedback from the students all the time and they had all kinds of suggestions about things they'd like to do more of or less of and, you know, all the important things I've learned about my classes I got from the students, but not once, not ever. Thousands of students over two decades, no student ever said, I wish you'd use the LMS more, not once ever. And it was just so frustrating and I'm sure other people will share this frustration so I probably don't even need to rant about it but just to to realize that what the administration was telling me I, I'm sure they believed it was true you know because canvas probably had some study that showed students want more LMS but it just wasn't true in my experience and it was really hard realizing that that my experience and what the administration was saying just didn't align yes absolutely you know, it's, I love that. Yeah, I absolutely think the LMS is the boot. And if you've never seen anything but a boot, you're going to ask for a boot. That's exactly it, right? And I love your work, Laura. And I love that you gave, you gave your students the, the, the ability to imagine something different. And then they said, why would we go back to the, why would we go back to the mass produced boot when there are these other options that are so much better? Um, and, but we have yeah. to be able to imagine those possibilities, uh, in, in order for it to be, in order, in order to, you know, in order to get there, we need the imaginaries first. I'm just looking, Clarissa, at what you have in the chat. How do we repair systems that are inherently oppressive? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I, for me, awareness, like it starts with awareness, right? Like, I, I don't know that we can, I, I, I don't think we can change them without at least being aware, but, you know, that's obviously not the whole answer. I don't know if other people have thoughts about a neat set of replace, repair or replace those oppressive, um, oppressive systems. Yeah, I, I, it's something I spent a lot of time thinking about. <laughs> so I'm going to have to read your chapter. I admittedly have not read it. <laughs> I've read other things you've written, but not this one. Um, because unlike Laura, my students ask for the LMS all the time. And I think it's because it's safe. It feels safe, but it doesn't, but it's oppressive. And so how to get students out of the maybe to help them understand the, the joy of something else. Um, I, just, I just don't have students that are as um, willing to try new things. Um, and so perhaps it's framing, perhaps it's something along those lines, but it's also trying to help them see the oppression the system has. Does that make any sense? I mean, I think it does. And it's interesting because when I wrote the blog post that led to the chapter, I was started as a vent about it was when I just, you know, Mastodon was new at the time. So I don't know, 2016, maybe. And some a bunch of people moved in there. And then a bunch of people on Twitter said it won't do this and it won't do that. And sometimes it breaks and blah, 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 whatever the whining was of, you know, in the nicest way possible. See, so I get to say whatever I want, um, you know, that it was hard. That it was harder and it was slower and it didn't have whatever feature it didn't have that Twitter had. So why would we use it? And especially why would we, it's hard to install, it's who would you use Ruby on Rails? All the things, all the reasons why we wouldn't possibly consider this slow, inefficient tool, right? We'll go back to Twitter. And that was really the, the day of thinking that started me down this path. Um, and, you know, and it's exactly that what your students, yeah, they want, 
Sure, you want the box that will do everything that has the bells and whistles exactly where you want it. It looks the same, you know, the Starbucks. It looks the same every time you know exactly what you're going to get. It's 100% predictable. There's a solution for that. But it comes at a cost. And, and that's the cost that I think we really need to think hard about. And, you know, and Laura, I mean, you can speak about the cost. I know there's a cost to you personally and, and you know, of, of making the decisions not like to say no to that standardized approach. Um, and, you know, people don't necessarily want it because it you have to be okay with it being harder because it will be harder. And I think that's a really important part. And it comes back to the resourcing and support for developing digital competencies in faculty and in students and, you know, Brian Lamb and I have talked a lot about this because, you know, you spend a career encouraging people out into the open and then a pandemic hits and you have to move 500 faculty teaching five courses a piece online and about a third of them have any comfort with any kind of digital tool. And all of a sudden we're just herding people into Moodle, like just <laughs> get into Moodle, do these five things. Please don't email us about anything. I know your open pedagogy project is great and I can't right now, right? And so, you know, the there's, when we talk about sort of what we wanna resource at the institution and the money folks are willing to spend, the institution's willing to spend on a learning management system, right? Like. There's also all the the add-on costs, and I'm I'm not convinced that like there's an easy answer that one is cheaper or more expensive than the other. But it's about where we want to spend our resources, and uh, I think there's a lot of good arguments, obviously, that everybody in this room is probably willing to share about having different having that opportunity to develop di different digital literacies is like really critical, right? But it doesn't happen in a vacuum, and and individual instructors being excited and willing and interested in play is awesome, but it's not, you know, I hate being the person in the room who's like, but it doesn't scale, but it doesn't, you know, from experience, it doesn't scale. So what then, right? And then we get into this harm reduction model of education, which is what I feel like Moodle is. I feel like Moodle, a self-hosted Moodle is like the harm reduction LMS experience and nobody's happy with it, right? Everybody hates it because they use Canvas at some other institution and it does so many more things and blah, 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 blah. I don't know if anybody has the answer. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I, I mean, so I'm going to defend a whole ed D based on scale, right? So scale and open education. So, um, I mean, that is the question that we come back to all the time is, but will it scale? Does it scale? And at, and, and, you know, and I, I am at the point now where I just say, if you want to scale, there's an answer to that. And it looks a certain way and accept the costs and be done with it. If you, don't want those costs, the answer is something that will not scale in the same way. And we have to acknowledge those trade-offs head on. And I, I'm not saying every time we're gonna pick small, but I'm saying we have to be honest about those trade-offs and recognize that when we, even at a little level, pick the, pick the easy way, pick the scalable way, that comes with costs that, and, and it's a decision. We are making decisions that have an impact and so we can't, we have to own the, we, we have to own our part and take responsibility for those decisions. And I'm not saying that it's easy. And I'm not saying that every time we will pick the small thing and, and the, the harder thing, but that we have to consider exactly like what I know you and Brenna, you and Brian are doing is consider that trade-off and, and recognize it and be honest and open about our part in, in enabling it in enabling you know, those, those scalable systems to per per perpetuate themselves. And, I think sorry, there's, I'm sorry. No, no, go I ahead. There's one more thing that I wanted to mention, and I, I find that institutions and systems do this a lot, is like get, um, like, I feel it sometimes when when we're pitting professors against students in terms of like, well, 
grading, I think grading and incompletes and not fulfilling requirement, right? Like those conversations are all, often pushed for students and professors to fight out those answers rather than institutions holding place for um, students who need to like drop out of a semester because of like life circumstances, right? Which is something I think that COVID has forced us to maybe have to recognize. <laughs> Um, but also be able to push to the margins. And I think the same thing with the LMS conversation, right? Um, this idea that like, it's assuming like an 18 credit model, which is an absurd amount of labor for students to take on, right? So the, the idea that something needs to be legible across six classes, five, six classes is like such a wild, like, our students are navigating so, so much, um, right? And so like, here we are having conversations about like, well, there has to be some legibility and like, we have to find a system to hold it. And it's like, well, wait, can we like back up the conversation one step here? Like, why are we asking so much of our students during this time? It's a lot, it's a lot, right? And so I think like, yeah, I, I do sort of like, I, I I hear the LMS conversation, um, but I'm also like, well, why is it so much? It's so much because we ask so much, right? And we see this when students need to drop down to half time, but their scholarships are at play, right? And international students who can't do online because we haven't accredited that far, right? Like we haven't accredited fully online programs. So they're just like out of luck. You know, like, so our systems don't have a lot of flexibility and yet the people in the systems always need to be the flexible ones, right? So it's just, a, it's a larger thing that I'm noticing um, about being part of an institution too, that I grapple with a lot. All right, Tanya, thank you so much. So, um... Now we can do two things. We have about 25 minutes. Um, I have prepared a section from a blog post um, so I can read that. But I also feel like I've already done a reading by responding to Tanya's reading. <laughs> um, or we, we could discuss some, you know, I have some prompt questions so perhaps we can have, a, have an open discussion. So I'd like to ask you, what would you like to do at this point? How do you feel like going about the session? Maybe we can do raise hands things <laughs> i don't know how i can do this but i'll try okay um yes anyone up for a reading uh, another reading let's do this brenna veronica thank you yes mora okay charles Oh, okay, Judith, Christina. Okay, thanks everyone. I think I won't do like, I won't compare things. I'll just do a reading. <laughs> okay, if you could just give me a minute, please. All right, so this one is from um, a blog post. It was also a talk given at the University of um, Highlands, University of Highlands and Islands uh, in Scotland um, on Women's Day. Um, and I talk about the title of the post is Feminist Critical Digital Pedagogy, Why Our Stories Matter. And sometimes it's quite difficult for me to understand feminist pedagogy because there are so many different views on it, the way you know we can go about feminist pedagogy. So in order to understand it, I always go back to my experiences growing up in Turkey, um, you know, in my family, in my community. Um, at school. So this post is really about that. It, it's a reflection on, you know, on my family and my family history. So I'm just going to read a brief section from that. <clears throat> the story I'd like to share is about my auntie Salma, who is now in her early 70s. She's a retired pharmacist and has three kids. At the age of 10 or 11, my auntie Salma found herself at a critical juncture in her life. She had just finished primary school, five years of compulsory education in a small town in central Anatolia in Turkey. My grandfather Yusuf wanted my auntie to continue with her education 
and start secondary school. But for my grandmother, Fatosh, the five years of schooling Salma had already had was more than enough for a girl. She insisted that she should stay home to help her with housework and to look after her brothers. My grandfather was a tall, gentle and kind man. My grandmother was very clever and she was very stubborn, which was a source of misery and humor for the family. So the story goes on like this. So this is a family story, the, the story I'm describing here, you know, um, uh, my auntie, she, she likes telling about this story. Fatosh, my grandmother, doesn't want my auntie Salma to go to secondary school. But my grandfather, Yusuf, wants her to go to secondary school, and they're having an argument about this. Yusuf says to my grandmother, Salma is a little girl. What do you expect her to do for you if she doesn't go to school? Fatosh replies, well, she can at least wash a few cups. Yusuf says, well, I'll wash your cups for you then. And he does. And Salma goes to secondary school and then high school and university. A new path, a new trajectory in the family history, a new orientation in Sarah Ahmed's words. Your grandfather, says my auntie, was a true advocate of women's rights. He fought for me throughout my education. When my auntie tells a story over WhatsApp, I can see her eyes sparkling with excitement, with love and admiration for her father. She is describing an intense experience with complex emotions because she worked so hard to get to where she's at now. My grandfather, of course, wasn't a feminist in a Western sense, and his dominance in this short story, in my description of how he enabled a women's education, my auntie's education, shows he was operating in a patriarchal society. He was a Kurdish man born in a Kurdish village with little resources, and he was very much connected to his traditions, his language, and his religion. But at the same time, he carried with him an openness to different ways of doing things, an openness to how one could live her life, which is a legacy he left to our family. I believe if my grandfather had lived in a different society, in different circumstances, he could have become a feminist, because I see in him, I see in him borrowing from Lev Vygotsky, the buds of feminism, the buds of feminist knowledge and practice. He wanted justice for his daughter. Reflecting on this experience, I see how important it is for people to have an open mind, openness to different ways of doing things, and challenge, critique, and reflect on tradition, if tradition becomes a structure for inequality. In contemporary UK higher education, this might include traditions in classrooms, in our institutions, processes, and systems. For example, when we think about teaching, how in the traditional behaviorist model, it is the teacher's job to teach and the student's job to learn. This is a very different way of thinking than Paula Freire's student teachers and teacher students, where student teacher interactions are a lot more, are a lot more democratic and horizontal. So I'll just scroll down a bit to finish this off. Um, Paula Freire famously said, authentic education is not carried on by A for B or by A about B, but rather by A with B. The stories we share with, another, with one another, the many different connections we make can be amazing resources for us to challenge oppressive systems of power and engage in authentic education. In the context of sexism and racism, Sarah Ahmed said, we have learned to severe the connection between this event and that, between this experience and that. To make a connection is thus to restore what has been lost. It is to generate a different picture. And I'll stop here. Oh, thank you, Brenna, for sharing the link. You're probably wondering, you know, what's it got to do with me or <laughs> with this conversation? Um, yeah, in the first part, I really wanted to talk about like, you know, um, openness as a way of being. Um, and also, you know, again, I think feminist pedagogy, and we also see this in the, um, some of the proposals, um, sometimes, you know, things like, um, the pedagogy of care or feminist pedagogy, these are used interchangeably. And sometimes I find hard to 
define feminist pedagogy for myself? What, what is it? Why am I doing this? Why am I so passionate about it? And I think the reason is really, it's about this personal experience and how I can see this personal experience is connected to wider issues. And that's exciting. That makes things passionate. And um, I wanted to talk about my family in this, um, in this talk because you know, our personal experience is so important and we always, like, we, we so often overlook that. We don't focus enough um, on our daily experiences, our struggles, pains. And I know, Brenna, you do this so well. You know, you theorize personal experience. And I think there's a need to um, theorize. And Tanya, also, you too. You know, you look at your family, you look at something you did with your grandmother, and then you theorize it. And I think we need that sort of thinking maybe more explicitly in educational technology um, and make connections, but also not simply focus on technology, you know, because it's not just about technology, of course, digital technology. It's a big picture, isn't it? So we're kind of like, with all these connections, we're building a picture and that picture changes, it shifts, but still it's very valuable. So I wanted to talk about that, bringing Sarah Ahmed, Paula Freire, but as well as bringing my own experience, my auntie, my grandfather, important figures in my, in my family. Um, so yes, so that was the uh, thinking behind this. I'll stop here. If you have any <laughs> questions or comments, just let me know. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was a beautiful reading and, and I, I, yeah, I love that idea that Bringing, bringing the outside in, right? Bringing, bringing the things from the experience. experience. I, I think for me, the you know, a, a feminist, a feminist way of thinking is a is an active. It's active. It, it's it's a it's a pedagogy. It's a way of thinking that's that's through action, um, and I and and or at least starts with action. So your story about you know how how your grandfather supported you know, it's the supportive actions came first and from that draws theory as opposed to starting with theory into action. And um, certainly that's something that, that draws me into, you know, feminist, feminist approaches over and over again is that it starts with an act of doing. So, I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, it's interesting because um, I felt like there was a need to define feminism in in this talk and also I think I did that for in our editorial as well and I used um, bell hooks's definition I, I felt like I really needed a definition you know I need a definition of feminist pedagogy um, a definition that makes sense to me and bell hooks talks about feminism uh, in terms of sexism sexist exploitation and also oppression her view is very much intersectional she doesn't only talk about like uh, you know, um, sexual oppression. It's like uh, her in her work is gender, race, and sexism, like all combined together. Um, what was interesting, Tanya, in your work is that I didn't feel like we were talking about oppression or sexism, but you were using a, a practice that has been something, you know, that sewing that women um, have been doing for generations in your in your context and using that as a theory to inform pedagogy which i thought was really interesting and it challenged my view of feminist pedagogy how i was trying to find a definition for it and then i thought hmm, you know maybe we don't need to have clear definitions you know it can be many different things yeah, i mean it's interesting to hear I, i'm thinking as you're saying that because it's it's interesting because because clearly the the women who i sewed with faced oppression in their own way um, and yet, you know, I, I remember my mother-in-law saying, you know, be, be, before before residential school, they didn't know what racism was because racism wasn't a thing, right? So, and so I try and imagine what it would be like to grow up in a place where you don't even, you know, and then to go from that to go to a place where where you don't know what oppression is, or, or you certainly don't know what that kind of structural racism oppression is, to one that's fully designed around that. Um, and I think that's maybe why when I think through their sewing, that idea of oppression doesn't come out because it's not, they've experienced it, but it's not a part of, of how they 
traditionally understood the world. And, and so if we're going to restore, it, you know, it's, it's, it's restoring with, with, um, with thinking how, what, what would the world look like if it wasn't structured by oppression, right? I think it's, you know, I don't pretend to know the answers to that, but I get, I think it, it again, pushes us to really think about what that would look like in, in, in a way, you know, in, in a different worldview where, where our actions weren't structured by, by something as, as both simple, simple and complicated as, as oppression. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good point. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, interesting. I think for my for my family as well, you know. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was different for older generations, for sure, you know. Um, younger generations are like much, much more passionate about, you know, their identity, how they live, uh, you know, in the in the society. Um, I was just going to say one thing. Um, but I can't remember it now. So if you could just give me a minute. We have only 10 minutes. I mean, we can end here. Or if you have more energy, we can talk more about these issues. Um, I just had a few prompt questions. Uh, it's quite long, isn't it? An hour and a half, you know, sitting in front of the um, computer. Um, yes, so... Yeah, uh, I don't know. How do you feel about discussing these? <laughs> Maybe this could be a good point to end this uh, conversation. We can always build on this conversation, but just wanted to highlight why I wanted to talk about this, add this to our, to our conversation. Uh, Sarah Ahmed, in her, in her work, she says, you know, in becoming feminist, we're doing intellectual work as well as emotional work because emotional, you know, because it's always tied to our experiences you know, the way we live in this world, the embodied experience. Um, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for bringing this experience into your work and for sharing with everyone. Um, just something to keep in mind, because I think another thing I'm realizing with this book project is that, you know, um, for example, we asked authors to use APA. <laughs> When you use APA, it's so difficult to write in an emotional, in a personal, in a connected way, isn't it? So uh, perhaps we also need to challenge the ways we go about academic writing, sharing. And I think my face is a great example for challenging that, you know, for providing an alternative uh, platform for people to share ideas. Um, so, yeah, so um, I don't have much I don't have much to add at this point. Um, so if you'd like to say anything, any final words, and maybe perhaps we can end here. It's certainly fine to end at any time that, that people feel comfortable doing so. It could even go on longer than an hour and a half if you want it. Um, there's no other MyFest uh, event happening right after this, so we're not, we're not bumping into anything. I just wanted to, to, to thank, well, I mean, this whole book project, I was going to say the, the, the editors, but also all of the contributors. It was a really positive experience to work on, and it um, helped me think about the process of academic writing, and particularly a kind of open and shared collaborative peer review process in really new and generative ways. So I'm just I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to be a part of it, and, and the op opportunity to share it with everyone here today has been great. Yeah, I, I agree. I want to say thank you as well, Brennan. And, and um, certainly the, the I love the open peer review process. I wonder if it makes us kinder people when uh, our names are attached to our comments. I'm not sure if it's just the people involved here, but certainly it was um, it was lovely to know who was commenting and and to to feel that connection. Um, and and certainly you know and the and the editors were were made it such a enjoyable and, and pleasurable experience yeah thank you everyone <laughs> we did it all together <laughs> but one thing i have to say the open re uh, peer review process it doesn't affect the quality of the work in any way and i think this is the way to go forward with academic peer review process it definitely makes us kinder also i think interestingly it makes people work even harder you know when you're 
when you know who, who is reviewing your paper, it's just the whole process. When you make it transparent, I think everyone is, feels more involved in it. Um, so yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been so great to meet you all.